Hello everyone. Welcome to this session. Hi everyone. Welcome to this session. In this session, we are going to discuss the important topics of ENT for the MCI exam. You know this. We have been doing this series for all the subjects at this great platform we offer them. DBMCI e Google. So, hi everyone. Welcome to this session. I hope that you are prepared to spend some time with me. Now, very quickly, very, very quickly, I'll tell you all the important points that you need to know for your MC exam. So, if you have not read ENT before, this session will be almost sufficient for you. Welcome, Hario. Now, uh, like I said, I'm going to do it very, very fast. Within two to two and a half hours, I'll complete all the important topics. So please stay and just follow very quickly. Now, I always start with ear and then throat and then nose. If I talk about ear, ear, we all know, has three parts external ear. Middle ear and inner ear. Out of these, middle ear is the most important part, whether it is anatomy, physiology, diseases, interface. Middle ear is the most important point. So we are going to spend most of our time talking about middle ear. External ear, inner ear, less important. So we are going to spend less time in these two parts. Now, if you have seen it in the lecture, you know that this is how you draw the ear. Now, this is your this much in the external ear. This part is the middle ear. And this part is the inner ear. Okay, so these are the three parts of the ear that you have to know. And talking about anatomy, like I said, middle ear is the only important part. So I'll spend few minutes talking about middle ear anatomy. Now, middle ear, what does it contain? Middle ear has six boundaries. Then you have superior boundary, inferior boundary, anterior boundary, posterior boundary. And that's the boundary, middle of the six boundaries, three compartments, the upper, middle, and lower three compartments. I think the audio is not clear. Except Voice is not clear still. So give me some time. We'll uh, fix the voice and start again. Hello. 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 So I hope, uh, the voice has been fixed. If you can hear me, is it better now? Should be. Uh, 
they're still trying to fix the voice still not working it seems hello hello checking voice checking audio checking hello 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 is it clear now i think now you guys can hear the voice hello 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 so i was talking about the boundaries of the ear anterior boundary what are the boundaries in the ear We have anterior boundary, we have posterior boundary, we have outer boundary, which is the lateral boundary, we have inner boundary, which is the middle boundary, superior boundary, and inferior boundary. Out of these six boundaries of the middle ear, you have to know about four. Anterior boundary has a very important thing called eustachian tube opening station tube opening is present on the anterior wall and station tube is a very important tube there are two or three very popular questions from here so we'll discuss those posterior boundary has pyramid among the important things pyramid with stapedius muscle Outer boundary is the tympanic membrane. I'll show you the image of tympanic membrane which forms the outer boundary of the middle ear. And inner boundary has promontory, oval window, and round window. So these are the main structures on the inner wall in the different walls of the middle ear out of which so the two important things that you have to know one is the eustachian tube opening like I told you eustachian tube opening has two or three points that you have to know and the second thing you have to know is the stapedius muscle stapedius muscle is present on the posterior wall of the ear okay so station tube and stapedius muscle what are the points about station tube that you have to know station tube is a tube the length is 36 millimeters long out of one third is made up of bone and inner two third is made up of cartilage and very very important is the function of eustachian tube I am sure you know the station tube has two functions one is balancing it balances the pressure of the middle ear and the second is drainage of secretion of middle ear so these are the two functions balances the pressure and drainage the secretion of the middle ear so these are the important out of many points the highlights of the station tube are these and similarly, ultimately the highlights of the stapedius muscle, uh, which is supplied by which nerve? Stapedius, uh, stapedius muscle 
is supplied by a branch of the facial nerve called nerve to stapedius. Nerve to stapedius is a branch of the seventh nerve. And the most important thing is the function. Do you know what is the function of stapedius muscle? It's called dampens loud sound. Dampens means it makes the sound less loud, decreases the loudness of the sound. If the sound is too loud, it can be dangerous. So it has to decrease. But how does it do this? By producing a reflex called a caustic reflex. Okay, so stupidus muscle produces a reflex called a caustic reflex, and this reflex will dampen the loud sound. In the acoustic reflex, there are two nerves. The afferent nerve is the eighth nerve, very, very important. And the efferent nerve is the seventh nerve. So, these two points are very important. Which is the afferent nerve? This is the efferent nerve with the acoustic reflex. So, it is given here. And the last thing, if the reflex is absent, if there is no reflex, that condition is called hyperacusis. It is hyperacusis when the reflex is absent. So, out of many things and many walls in the middle ear, these are the two most important things that you have to know about. Okay. And then, <coughs> this is how I, this is a tympanic membrane. It is pearly white in color and only 0 0.1 millimeter thick. So, these are the two important points about the tympanic membrane anatomy. That is it to know. Now, if you look at the diagram, if you can understand, this structure that you see is the handle of malleus. Okay, you are supposed to identify the handle of malleus. This tip point of the handle of malleus is called the umbo. And this structure, which I'll mark with blue, this one. <coughs> now, this is called the lateral process. These are the three things that you can see normally on the tympanic membrane. From top down, there is a lateral process, there is a handle of malleus, there is umbo, and all the three are called landmarks of tympanic membrane. They are the landmarks of tympanic membrane. That is it. Okay. So, middle we have done all the things. Then we talk about the test, hearing test. The tuning for test is the most important test that they ask in the exam. Last year also in the uh, in your exam in the MCI screening test, there is a question on tuning for. So, this is a very important topic. These are the three most important tests that we do from the tuning for. Renee's test, Weber's test, Swabex test. Now, Weber's test is the most sensitive tuning for test. That what is the meaning of this word? That Weber's test is the most sensitive. That it can pick up the minimum hearing loss. The minimum hearing loss can be picked by the Weber's test. Now, tuning for you have to know the basics of it. It's like mathematics. Without knowing the basics, you can't do mathematics. And this is just a fast revision. So I cannot teach you the basics, but I'll give you two very important questions which are very commonly asked in a tuning for test. One question they ask you. Suppose this is the right ear and this is the left ear. On the right side, AC is more than BC. On the left side also, AC is more than BC. So, both sides AC is more than BC. AC more than BC is called the positive renis. So, both are positive renis. And Swabex is reduced, which is less on the right side, less than the examiner. And Swabex is less on the left side also. This is shown with the arrow. <clears throat> and if Webbus is going to do a left side. Right. Now, this is the question that what is the diagnosis now? If both sides is AC more than BC, 
both sides webex is reduced webex is going to the opposite side then what is your diagnosis in this case it is bilateral sensory neural hearing loss because if swabex is less it is confirmatory of sensory neural hearing loss so this side also swabex is less so both side is sensory neural hearing loss and in bilateral sensory neural hearing loss like in this case the webbers which is this one goes to the better side so left is better side that means right is worse side so right has more SNHL then left okay so it's bilateral SNHL but one is more one is less which is more SNHL the right is more SNHL because in SNHL webus goes to the opposite side so look at the webus arrow is left side that means right is more SNHL now like I said if you don't know or you don't understand then uh, you have to go back and look at your basics because here we cannot discuss the basics if you have attended the lecture you can answer this question very easily if not just try to remember this now there is a very second question which is also a very popular question in a tuning fork in which they say say this is the right ear and this is the left ear right is AC more than BC see AC more than BC is positive in this so this is positive on the right side but on the left side it is BC more than AC <coughs> BC more than AC is negative release so right is right side is positive in this left side is negative in this and the web bus is going to the right side there is no swavax this time so what is the diagnosis now what is the problem in this patient if you have bc more than ac with webbus webbus is going to the opposite side left as bc but webbus is going to the opposite of left right side this tells you left is severe snhl so left side is severe sensory neural hearing loss okay so in this case the left has sense severe sensory neural loss how do i know because if it is bc more than ac and webbus is going to the opposite of that side in this case it is going to opposite right uh, left side to the right side it is severe snhl and right side could be normal or less snhl both are possible in this case once again like i said i can't explain to you why this happens but if you don't know the basics just remember this that should be sufficient for you so remember these two tests very very important very commonly asked in the exam in tuning fork so after that we will talk about the uh, audiometry let's talk about audiometry what has happened to this It's called pure tone audiometry in short. Audiometry is a test of hearing and it's a subjective type of test. It's a subjective test of hearing test. That means it cannot be done in children. This is what it means when we say it's a subjective test that it cannot be done in children. Okay. Now, audiometry, there is a graph like this, which has an x and a y axis. And in the graph, you see four graphs like this. One is right ear AC, one is left ear AC, right ear BC, left ear BC, and they are symbols. Symbols like X or circle or this sign or this sign. Ideally, you are supposed to know all the four, but X or which is cross stands for AC of left ear. This is AC of left ear this is the only thing about the symbols in audiometry that you have to know okay next is tympanometry tympanometry is also called impedance audiometry
the name is an mcq what is the other name for tympanometry impedance odometry is an answer is a very important point now in tympanometry there are types of tympanogram there are five types one is called a type a s type a d type b which is called flat type and c which is called negative type out of the five types two are important you have to know when do you get a s type of tympanogram very 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 important s should remind you of sclerosis so this is seen in a condition called autosclerosis so remember this a s type of tympanogram is seen in autosclerosis and the second one they ask you is b type b type is seen in serous otitis media that's why i'm not writing all of them because i need to tell you the important ones only last moment just few months left one month just over one month i don't want to give you too much of information which is not important so i'm just giving you the high yield points out of five just two types remember these two next investigation bera bera stands for this is the full form of bera brain stain evoked response odometry just remember the full form there is one more test which is as useful as bera alternative to this it's a different test called oae now what is oae auto acoustic emission is the full form of oae now there is a very important point about oae who produces the oe oe is produced by outer hair cells of cochlea this is a very important mcq who produces oae oe is produced by the outer hair cells of cochlea now why am i talking about these two tests at the same time together because they are both used in similar condition or similar uses there are two use of both of them and this is the only thing you have to know first use of bera and oae is to screen or confirm hearing loss in infants in a small child if you want to confirm hearing loss you can do one of the two you can do bera you can do oae but if you are allowed to pick one answer if both are given in the choices and you are allowed to pick only one answer so which is a better answer which one do you pick up suppose they ask you which of the following is a, a investigation of choice for hearing loss in an infant or a newborn child in small kids both are correct answer you are allowed to pick one go for oae as a better answer so oae is a better answer as compared to bera right and what is the second use the second use is they can help you differentiate between cochlear disease and retrocochlear disease what is the meaning of this for those who don't know and this is done in a patient who has sensory neural hearing loss so if somebody has sensory neural hearing loss this are two causes of snhl either it is due to cochlear disease disease of the cochlea or it's due to disease of the retrocochlea retrocochlea means eighth nerve disease eighth nerve disease are called retrocochlear disease so if it is snhl it could be due to cochlea or eighth nerve and how do you know is it due to cochlea or eighth nerve you can do bera or oa both can help you know whether this snhl is due to cochlea or due to the eighth nerve so this is the meaning of this sentence that it helps you differentiate between cochlear disease and retrocochlear disease so only these two points about bera and oe nothing much so this will complete all the hearing tests like tuning fork audiometry tympanometry bera autocosmic i tell you the main highlights of this investigations there are some balancing test also the most important balancing test is a caloric test now caloric test is also called bithermal caloric test ct stands for bithermal caloric test right now in bithermal caloric test i tell you what is the position of the patient 
but before that very important thing cows is a mnemonic based on a very important mcq they ask you if you shrink the ear with cold water which is 30 degree then nystagmus is on which side or if you shrink the ear with warm water which is 44 degree then nystagmus is on which side so with cold water the nystagmus o stands for opposite side that means if you see in the right ear with 30 degree water, nystagmus will be opposite of the right is left side. So, on the left side. But if you see in the left ear with 30 degree water, then nystagmus will be opposite of the left which is right side. But if you see with warm water, which is 44, S stands for same side. So, this is the mnemonics and this is a very useful mnemonics. With cold water, if you see in the nystagmus will be on the opposite side. With warm water, if you see in the nystagmus will be on the same side. And this is what you have to remember about the calorie test now this test is done in a particular position so what is the position of the patient during the caloric test this is the position of the patient during the calorie test what is this called this is called supine and raise head by 30 degree this is what you do make the patient line on supine like you can see the image and the patient's head you see there it's you create an angle of 30 degree with the floor now you do the test it's called the caloric test or by thermal caloric test but if you are in a hurry you want to do it very fast you don't have time to make the patient lie down like this and correct the position then you can do the patient in sitting position also so if you do a caloric test in a sitting position the name of the test is different it's called modified cobra test okay so what is modified cobra test it's a type of caloric test same thing only the position of the patient is different this time the patient is made to sit down and then you carry out this particular test okay so this much about the caloric test and the last test is a fistula test which is done to diagnose the fistula in the ear Obviously, from the name I understand, it is used to diagnose fistula in ear. Now, to do a fistula test, we need an instrument. And that instrument is a very popular instrument, which is the instrument that we need to carry out the fistula test. And this is that instrument called Siegel's Speculum. It is a very popular instrument, very commonly asked in the exam, Siegel's Speculum is see look at this uh, usual sickle speculum this is what i'm talking about is used to do a fistula test right but you notice from this uh, slide that fistula test can be done used for other uses also and this is another very important mcq that which are the other uses of sigil speculum as you can see it can be used for powdered medication fistula sign of course there then it is used for brown sign and gallus test also Gallus test is a tuning for test. Brown sign will discuss in glomus tumor. So, we will discuss all these things. Don't worry if you don't know the names. But remember, when is Siegel speculum used? Siegel speculum is used for all these conditions. Those are given in your uh, slide. Now, talking about fistula test, fistula test can have many options. It can be true positive fistula test and false positive fistula test. So, when do you get a true positive fistula test? When do you get a false positive fistula test? Sometimes they ask you. They are not very popular question, but just I will tell you one or two points just in case. Now, first thing, false positive fistula test is also called Hennebert sign. So, remember this name. The name could be important. Hennebert sign is the other name for false positive fistula test. Okay, that is one thing. True positive fistula test has no other name. It is only called true positive fistula test it has no name like Hennebert sign is the name for false positive now when do you get true positive test when do you get false positive test true positive fistula test the most common condition is labyrinthine fistula labyrinthine fistula see the name of the disease is fistula and the name of the test is also fistula so obviously and it's also seen after stapedectomy surgery if you do a stapedectomy surgery which is done for a disease called autosclerosis. We will discuss autosclerosis. We do not know. Do not worry. After that surgery, you might get a true positive fistula test. 
Now there are other conditions also which can give rise to true positive physical stress. These are the two important. One more I tell you, type 5 tympanoplasty. Type 5 tympanoplasty can also give rise to true positive physical stress. So these are the three important diseases where true positive physical stress might be seen. And when do you get a false positive physical test? One important disease, Meniere's disease. We will discuss Meniere's disease also. And keep in mind that Meniere's disease can give rise to Hennebert sign, which is the other name for false positive Fisla test. Okay. So, these are the uh, uh, points about the Fisla test. And this will complete all the important points about all the investigations for hearing and balancing that you need to know in the ear. And now we will start with diseases of the ear. We will we'll first talk about inflammatory disease and then we will talk about non-inflammatory disease and tumors. So, let us start with inflammatory disease of the ear. Now, I will divide, I will you know, I will not talk about individual disease because it will take a lot of time. I will make a column like this. I will write all the names of the all the important diseases and then tell you only the important points about each of them. Right. So, one of them is malignant otitis externa. It's a very popular disease of the external ear, malignant otitis externa. Then we have ASOM, acute superative otitis media. Then we have uh, glue ear. Glue ear has many names. It's also called serous otitis media. OM is otitis media. Then we have uh, unsafe CSOM. Then we have safe CSOM and we have tuberculosis of middle ear. So, it is called tubercular otitis media. Okay. Now, these are the popular inflammatory disease of the ear. See, in one uh, column, in one uh, slide, I will tell you all the important points so that it is very easy for you to revise at the last moment. First thing, which are the main pathogen for each of them? So, malignant otitis externa is caused by pseudomonas. Right. ASOM is mainly caused by strep pneumonia. This is the most common pathogen. The other pathogen also, but this is the most important pathogen in ASOM, streptococcus pneumonia. Now, very interestingly, in blue ear, serious there is no pathogen. There is no pathogen. Then safe and unsafe, both are CSOM. So, CSOM both are caused by pseudomonas. So, I am writing commonly pseudomonas and tubercular of course, we know mycobacterium. Okay. So, we know the pathogen. Okay. Now, any otitis media is going to cause hearing loss. Hearing loss is the main complaint for all of them, but is there any other special complaint besides hearing loss? So, in malignant otitis externa, HL hearing loss is the only main complaint. In ASOM, hearing loss plus pain. Pain could be the other important complaint. In blue ear, only hearing loss, no other complaint. In safe CSOM, uh, non smelly discharge. Non smelly discharge. The discharge is coming from the ear, there is no smell in the discharge. In safe, uh, this is safe CSOM, sorry, non smelly discharge. Is safe CSM. Unsafe CSM is a foul smell discharge. Please make a correction. Unsafe has foul smelly discharge. Safe has non smelly discharge. So the discharge has no smell in it. And in tuberculosis, painless, there is no pain and watery discharge. So there is no pus this time. There is water like discharge that comes from the ear. Okay. So, we know the main complaint for each of them. Then, main finding. Now, this is the crux. What are the findings in each of them? Because finding is the one that is going to confirm the diagnosis. In ASOM, there are many findings. I will tell you only three important ones. There is red bulging membrane. Red and bulged in the membrane. There is cartwheel appearance. The tympanic movement looks like a bullock cart and you can see fluid level. 
you can see the fluid which is collection in the middle here. So these are the three complaints or findings in uh, these are the findings of uh, ASO actually. I have written here. Uh, these are the finding of ASOM. So I should have written here these three things. Red and bulging tympanic membrane, cartwheel and fluid level are the feature of ASOM not in uh, in malignant rotaestona the important finding is granulation in external ear. Granulation in external auditory canal is the finding of malignant otitis externa. Then blue ear, there is retracted tympanic membrane and something called air bubbles seen. You can see air bubbles and foreshortened handle of malleus. So these are the three findings in blue ear, retracted tympanic membrane, air bubbles can be seen, poor shortened handle of malleus. In ASOM you can see red bulging, cartwheel and fluid level. Then in unsafe CSOM, uh, I will tell out of many things, I will tell you two important things, they are red granulations, red granulations and marginal perforation. There is a perforation on the margin of the tympanic membrane on the edge of the tympanic membrane. So that's called marginal perforation. In safe CSOM, you will see the central perforation. The perforation is in the center of the tympanic membrane. So the site of the perforation can help you make a diagnosis sometimes. And in tuberculosis, what do you see? Multiple perforation. Multiple perforation plus pale granulation. See in unsafe, if you look at the unsafe, there is red granulation, but in tuberculosis, there is a pale color granulation. Now these findings are very, very important because these are the one that help you make a diagnosis of this various kind of product because the complaint is very similar. They, most of them have hearing loss, maybe it's pain and discharge and all that, but the findings are so different that they can help you make a diagnosis. Now investigation of choice. In malignant odorization, uh, you have to do a technetium 99 scan. Scintigraph it is called. Now this becomes the investigation of choice. Technetium 99 scintigraphy. In ASOM, there is no investigation of choice. In blue ear, tympanometry is the investigation of choice. And if you remember, Tympanometry will discuss B type tympanogram you will get in this. So, B type tympanogram is a diagnostic finding of blue ear. In safe CSOM, uh, there is no investigation required. In unsafe, you can do uh, microscopy examination. Microscopy can be done. And in tuberculosis, you have to stain. In any tuberculosis, staining has to be done to confirm the diagnosis. This much we understand. And this is true for all tuberculosis. And finally, the treatment of choice. In malignant odysona, we have to give third generation cephalosporin. This is called the drug of choice in malignant odysona, third generation cephalosporin. Of course, you have to give anti-diabetics also because malignant odysona is seen in anti-diabetic cycle so right here plus anti-diabetic. In ASOM, we do miringotomy plus nasal decongestants are the main thing. Miringotomy and nasal decongestants. Maybe antibiotics can be useful because it has a lot of bacteria. So, antibiotics would be useful. And now comes a very important question. The treatment for blue ear is a very, very important MCQ. It is asked many times. What is the treatment for blue ear? Again, you do miringotomy plus grommet insertion. Grommet is a tube. I'll show you the image. You have to insert the grommet plus 
this is what we forget you have to write adenoidectomy so look for the choice which is adenoidectomy in it and that is the correct answer right so this is what we sometimes people forget to remember that adenoidectomy has to be done for glue ear in unsafe CSUM, the treatment is modified radical mastoidectomy it's called mrm in short modified radical mastoidectomy is the treatment for glue ear now in safe csum you have to do meringoplasty meringoplasty And in blue ear, I don't have to tell you that you have to give anti in uh, tuberculosis, we have to give anti tubercular therapy. Okay, so this is this is one chart, one slide, and everything about otitis media, all types of uh, inflammation of the ear, the main highlights, the points are given here. So it should be very, very beneficial and useful uh, at the last moment, just before the exam, just look at this paper. A slide is going to really help you okay so in my opinion this is an extremely important slide now in unsafe CSUM there's something called cholesterol these are the images now you can see these are the image of the ASUM so this is red and bulging tympanic membrane now this is called cartwheel appearance and the last one is uh, fluid level this is fluid level seen so these are all images of asum patient easy to diagnose right then these are the image of a glue ear now this is how retracted tympanic membrane looks like is a feature of glue ear and the last one is air bubbles this is air bubbles image of air bubbles of a glue ear so again, uh, images, this image of blue ear and this image of ASUM, they are so different that diagnosing these two conditions on the basis of the images are very, very easy. That's why images are also important. And then this is how a grommet insertion is being done. Can you see the small tube in the second image? This tube is the grommet. So you do meringotomy. Meringotomy is making an opening. In the first image, you can see an opening is made on the tympanic pigment. Through that hole that you have created, you put a tube. This tube is called grommet, which is done for glue ear. And look at this image. This is the actual tympanic movement with grommet. So you can see this green thing is the grommet. Grommet is also called ventilating tube. Ventilating tube, which is done for glue ear or serous otitis media. So this image again is a very, very important image. Now, I was talking about this is central perforation. Can you see the tympanic membrane has a perforation in the center? When do you get central perforation? This is safe CSUM. Remember, in safe CSUM, there is a central perforation. In unsafe CSUM, there is marginal perforation. In tuberculosis, there is multiple perforations. So, this is again an important image central perforation, easy to identify this image. Okay. Now, Cholestoma is a very important feature of safe CSUM. This white thing that you see in the image is a cholestoma. It's a sac of keratinized squamous epithelium. This is the definition of cholestoma. It's a sac of keratinized squamous epithelium. And the most common site of cholestoma is a site called Prusax space. Remember this very important name, Prusak space is the most common site of cholestoma. Now, cholestoma has types, congenital and acquired, at birth is congenital, after birth is acquired, acquired can be primary acquired and secondary acquired. Now, you don't have to know the details too much of this, uh, of cholesterol, but these are the points. And because cholesterol is a feature of unsafe CSUM, the treatment again is MRM. Because unsafe CSUM, remember MRM, 
if I show you this image table, uh, unsafe CSOM MRM here, and customize the feature of unsafe, so MRM. Now, I'm going to create many tables like this. As going forward, lot of tables I'm going to create so that A, we can finish off very, very fast our revision and B, when you want to revise, I guarantee that ENT you'll be able to revise and towards the exam in one hour, less than one hour, you can quickly revise. I'll make uh, such easy for you. Okay. So, Anand Pillai, good evening. Come, welcome. Then we talk about surgeries of the year. These are the common surgeries that we do for otitis media. Most of the names are very popular names. I'm sure you know this name, Miringotomy, Miringotomy with grommet, Miringoplasty, Ossicloplasty, Tympanoplasty, Mastodectomy. I've mentioned this name in that list, many of these names. And we already know the indications. But if I still ask you the indications of these uh, surgeries, so you know that Miringotomy is done for ASOM. All this is given in the table that we just created. Meaning what with grommet is done for uh, glue ear, serous otitis media. Again, we know. Meaning of plasty, if you remember, is done for safe CSOM. And the last one, mastodectomy, is done for unsafe CSOM. Now, this much we know already. So, I did not tell you this. Now, there are two surgeries left here. These two, osseoplasty and tympanoplasty. They are done for two diseases. They can be done for safe CSOM and for unsafe CSOM. So, they have two indications. They are for safe as well as for unsafe CSOM. Now, the most important surgery in this list, meaning what and grommet, I have already shown you the uh, images and how does the grommet look like. Uh, the most important surgery in this list is tympanoplasty. You know what is the meaning of tympanoplasty? Tympanoplasty is miringoplasty plus osseoplasty done together. If you do miringoplasty plus osseoplasty at the same time, the surgery becomes tympanoplasty. That's what it means. And if you remember the indications, I just told you that it has two indications. It is done for safe CSOM and for unsafe CSOM. <clears throat> this I just told you, two indications. Now comes the most important thing about tympanoplasty. Now this slide that I am going to show you is an extremely important slide, guys and girls. Look at this slide very carefully and remember this because tympanoplasty has types. There are five types of tympanoplasty which is given in the slide that in front of you. And the name of the classification or grading or types is modified Woolstein classification. This name is not very important. You can ignore the name Woolstein classification, but the types are very, very important. Type 1, type 2, type 3, type 4, type 5. Extremely important slide. Okay. And what is given? The other name for this type. Like type 1 tympanoplasty, if you look at the first one, is also called Miringoplasty. And type 2 has no other name. But type 3 has two names, columella and stipidomeringopexy. There are two names for type 3, columella. And columella is a very, 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 very important MCQ. They ask you so many times, what is the what is columella surgery? Columella surgery is type 3 tympanoplasty or also stipidomeringopexy or meringostepidopexy as is given. But these are the two names for type 3. Now, type 4 has no name. But type 5 is called fenestation surgery. So, see, if you have noticed, the odd ones have names. Odd ones means first, third and fifth have names. And the even ones, even means second and fourth do not have names. So, that's how you can remember that odd ones have names. Fenestation surgery is not done nowadays. But there are two things they ask you. In this, we create a fistula. Fistula on LSCC. You know what is LSCC? LSCC stands for lateral semicircular canal. So basically, we disturb the lateral semicircular canal during the surgery. And if you disturb the lateral canal, the patient starts having vertigo. And the patient after the surgery begins to complain of vertigo. So if I tell you that I have done a tympanoplasty, 
and I'm, the patient complains of vertigo after the surgery, which type of tympanoplasty have I done? You know the answer, type 5. In rest of them, there is no vertigo. Type 5 can create vertigo. The names are very, very important. Which type is called what name? I'm not going to go into the details of the surgery, but this is what you have to remember. And one or two points about mastodectomy surgery also. Now, mastodectomy surgery are three types. One is called simple mastoidectomy. The second one is called MRM. MRM, I just told you, done for unsepsis from MRM. And the third is radical mastoidectomy. Okay, these are the three types of mastoidectomy. Now, what you have to know, two things. MRM has two subtypes. What is called canal wall op surgery. Canal wall up MRM. The other is opposite of this. Canal wall down MRM. Okay, so the two types of MRM and radical mastoidectomy has three steps and this is sometimes asked what are the three steps of radical mastoidectomy. You know, the easy way of remembering what are the three steps if you cannot remember, you can remember they all start with the letter E. E. So, <clears throat> one E stands for exteriorization. Remember this term. I am not going to explain to you what is the meaning of this word, but remember this word, exteriorization. Now, second thing, except put plate, everything else is removed. In radical mastectomy, we remove everything from the ear except the foot plate of the steps. So, except foot plate, everything else is removed from the ear. And third is 10 for station tube is closed or blocked, you can say. So, when you do all the three steps, it becomes a radical mastectomy and this could be an important MCQ for you, right? So, out of the name of the surgery that I have shown, these two surgeries are important. Tympanoplasty, very, very important and few things about mastectomy that you can see on your screen and all this radical and modified radical, as we know, are done for unsafe CSU. This we know from the table that I just shown you about the surgeries. Okay, so these are the important points about uh, otitis media, the eye media table. Then uh, I talked about the surgeries of otitis media. Now, then we talk about uh, some of the important complications of otitis media. Again, I am going to make a table and tell you only one, maybe two points about some of the important complications of otitis media. So, what are the important complications of otitis media? Mastoiditis. Gradimigos syndrome, labyrinthine fistula, lateral sinus thrombosis, and facial palsy. Okay, now these are the common complications of otitis media, and I very quickly tell you all the important points about these otitis media. Now, mastoiditis presentation is pain and discharge, ear discharge. Findings are important. Or what is the uh, Gradingo syndrome finding? Gradingo syndrome, they all have same findings. Pain and discharge. This is also pain and discharge. In labyrinthine fistula, there is vertigo, vertigo and nausea. Lateral sinus thrombosis, there is a picket fence fever. This name is a very important name, picket fence fever. This is a fever which rises and falls and rises and falls every few hours. So, if you make a fever chart, this is how the fever chart looks like that I have drawn. Rising, falling, rising, falling. That's why it's called picket fever. And facial palsy, of course, uh, uh, asymmetry on the face. Yes or no? Asymmetry on face. The face is not symmetrical on both the sides. So, that's the complaint. Now, what is the problem in some of them? Mastoiditis, obviously, the main problem is mastoid bone. It's a problem of the mastoid bone. Gradinogos syndrome is a problem of, you know what? This is very important. Gradingo syndrome is a problem of Petrus apex. Petrus apex and fifth and sixth nerves. 
So this is very important. In Pitre's apex, the fifth and the sixth nerves are involved. That is what gradient syndrome is all about. What is the site of the labyrinth and fistula? It's bulge of LSCC. LSCC. Remember LSCC I told you is lateral semicircular canal. So there is a fistula on the bulge of that LSCC and that is the site of the problem. Lateral sinus thrombosis, the site is lateral sinus of course. And facial palsy is the facial nerve is the site of the problem. The site which area is having problem all that. And now comes the most important thing in these complications that what are the special features complain presentation in mastoiditis there are four special features they are called lighthouse sign reservoir sign and out mastoid and pinna is pushed antero inferiorly pinna is pushed antero inferior now these are the points about lat mastoiditis which are very very important granulocal syndrome there are three d's and this is a very very important mcq what are the three D's of granulocal syndrome? There is discharge, diplopia, and deep pain. I can't tell you how important is this one. The three D's discharge, deep pain, diplopia in granulocal syndrome. In labyrinth and fistula, there is nystagmus. Nystagmus. And remember, true positive fistula sign. When I was talking about true positive fistula sign, I give you three causes of true positive fistula sign. This was the first name, labyrinth and fistula, true positive fistula sign. Now, the signs of lateral sinus thrombosis is very, very important. What are the sign? What are the, uh, the four signs called gray singer sign, delta sign, Tobe air sign and Krobeck sign. Now, guys and girls, in, in facial palsy, there is no sign and nothing of the sort. So, I am not going to talk about that. So, these are the main treatment, all of them required uh, either MRI or CT scan, and surgery is the ultimate treatment in all of them. MRM has to be done, modified radical mastoidectomy has to be done for all of them. Now, I am not going to explain other points because like I said, I want to give you the minimum information and with maximum output so that they can help you revise in the last moment. I don't want to give you too much of information where you can't revise because you have to revise 19 subjects in all. So, only when you give limited information, you can revise at the last moment many times. You have to multi revise multiple times. So, I am giving you very, very limited information. Okay. Now, so after this, uh, this is how the ironed out mastoid of the uh, mastoiditis looks like. This is ironed out mastoid. Look at the skin of the mastoid, very smooth and shiny. This is ironed out mastoid. Now, <clears throat> these are the other causes of facial palsy. We have discussed facial palsy can be caused by a complication of otitis media. We have done this. Now, these are some of the other causes of facial palsy. Uh, they are not very important. Uh, the Bell's palsy is the most common cause of facial palsy. Remember this one is also called idiopathic facial nerve palsy. Facial palsy is called idiopathic facial palsy. And two things about this facial palsy, idiopathic facial palsy. The treatment of choice is steroids for two to three weeks. This is the main thing. Lot of books will tell you should you should give acyclovir and physiotherapy. Well, those are optional. This is the main thing. Now comes very important MCQ. If there is no response with steroid, then we do decompression of facial nerve.
so these are the two points about bell's palsy or idiopathic facial nerve palsy the main treatment is steroid and if that fails i have to do decompression of the facial nerve okay right and these are the other causes uh, you can ignore the causes except the first one which is the most common cause of facial palsy and this is how the patient of bell's palsy or facial palsy looks like you if you look at the two sides of the face in both this patient they are asymmetry there is no symmetry in the two sides and this is very typically a lower motor neuron palsy type of palsy okay now this will complete all the important points about inflammation of the disease then we talk about uh, another topic uh, we'll talk about two tumors of the year glomus tumor a caustic pneumonia only two important tumors in the year, only three or four points about each of them, not too much. Now, glomus tumor is also called a paraganglioma. Glomus tumor is a paraganglioma. A caustic pneuma is a vestibular schwannoma. Vestibular schwannoma. Now, both the site most common site of glomus tumor is not an ENT area so fingertip which is not an ENT area a caustic pneumonia is cerebellar pontine angle this is a very important MCQ which is the commonest site of acoustic pneumonia cerebellar pontine angle from inferior vestibular nerve now this is another important point from which nerve a costing pneuma arises from inferior vestibular nerve obviously the ear disease so there has to be hearing loss hearing loss is the main complaint but we want to know other than hearing loss what are the other features in glomus tumor there is a very important feature or complaint called pulsatile tinnitus remember this Pulsatile tinnitus is the most common, not the most common, is the most important complaint which can help you make a diagnosis very, very important. Whereas in acoustic pneuma, of course, along with hearing loss, uh, there is uh, tinnitus and hearing loss. But there is loss of corneal reflex is another very important sign you can say loss of corneal reflex so pulsatile tinnitus loss of corneal reflex very very important and now comes signs any special sign in glomus tumor there are four signs only the names they are called rising sun sign brown sign if you remember brown sign we need seagull speculum when i was shown the image of the seagull speculum uh, the user of single scale, there was one name brown sign and this sign is seen in glomus tumor a uh, phelps sign and aquino sign so four signs only the names are the four signs in glomus tumor don't try to read the uh, details of them not important if you know that these are sign in glomus tumor that should be important sufficient when in a costume tumor, there is a sign called Stillberger sign he's still burger's sign so only one important sign and finally the investigation of choice treatment of choice in glomus tumor the investigation of choice will be contrast enhanced ct scan the main thing whereas in glomus tumor the investigation of choice will be gadolinium mri gadolinium mri is the investigation of choice ct scan versus mri and the last point the treatment of choice in glomus tumor we have to do embolization which means we, we have to block the blood vessel which is supplying the tumor it's a vascular tumor embolization and surgical excision you have to do surgery and exercise for surgery you can use a bipolar cautery or a laser bipolar cautery or laser can be used now in glomus tumor surgery is the investigation of choice uh, treatment of choice 
but they ask you about a special type of radiotherapy which is used for glomus tumor, uh, caustic neuroma called gamma knife stereotactic radiotherapy. It's a special type of radiotherapy called gamma knife stereotactic radiotherapy which is used for a caustic neuroma. So see, uh, one slide, two important tumors of the year, all the important points will not even take five minutes for you to revise if you don't already know this. So that's the importance that I'll make a lot of these tables throughout our discussion today. Okay, that will finish off fast and also easy to revise. So we have done both the tumors and then we have three, this is how uh, a gadolinium MRI looks like on gadolinium MRI of a caustic neuroma. So this tumor, that white thing that you see is a, a caustic neuroma in the CP angle, cerebellopontine angle from the inferior vestibular nerve. Okay. Now then we, we have done the infective diseases, we have done tumors and now these are the three non-infective diseases of the year. Another very, very important topic, the non-infective disease of the year. Now, uh, do they have any other name? Uh, Autosclerosis has no other name. BPPV has no other name. But Meniere's disease is called endolymphatic high drops. This is a name for Meniere's disease and this is a very popular name. They ask you, what is the other name for Meniere's disease? Endolymphatic high drops is an important MCQ. Okay. Then site. Most common site of uh, autosclerosis, very, very popular MCQ is fistula antifenestrum. They ask you what is the site of Meniere's disease. So you say membranous labyrinth is the site. This is the site of Meniere's disease, membranous labyrinth. And the site of BPPV is another MCQ, posterior semicircular canal. The most common site is posterior semicircular canal. Right. Then the main presentation or complaint. Now this part is important because in these diseases, usually they give you a history. They will give you a line, you know, such and such patient present with such and such things. So by looking at the history in all the three, you have to make a guess that what kind of disease are we dealing with. So in autosclerosis, it's a very typical history. Uh, th this is how they a 30 years old pregnant lady with conductive hearing loss. So if you read this kind of a line that a around 30 years old lady and has a conductive, she is pregnant and she has a conductive hearing loss, it has to be autosclerosis and nothing else, straight away. In Meniere's disease, a 45 years male with fluctuating sensory neural hearing loss and episodic vertigo. These are two. The hearing loss is fluctuating SNHL and the episodes are there. There could be other things also, tinnitus and all are there. But the two main things that will help you make a diagnosis are these two things. Fluctuating. So fluctuating and episodes are very, very important word. And in BPPV, it's positional vertigo. less than 20 seconds. So positional vertigo means the patient will say whenever I change my head position or whenever I turn my head, I have vertigo. So that's a very typical thing, positional vertigo. Right. Then special features. So these are the main complaints, any signs, special features. If you remember, in autosclerosis, there is a sword sign. which is flamingo pink blush on tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane becomes flamingo pink color. So the pink color of the membrane is a called sword sign. This is seen in autosclerosis. Then there is paracusis willisi.
and this Kahar's notch in pure tone audiometry. If you do a pure tone audiometry, you can see a Kahar's notch in that thing, right? In Meniere's disease, if you remember, there is Hennebert sign. Remember, Hennebert sign is the other name for false positive fistula sign. So that Hennebert sign is a feature of Meniere's disease. But the other thing in Meniere's that you might see besides Hennebert sign is a Tullio's phenomena. In Tullio's phenomena, when there is a loud sound, patient has vertigo. The, whenever there is loud sound, the patient starts having a vertigo. This is called Tullio's phenomena and maybe recruitment. If you hear this or read this word recruitment, Meniere's should come to your mind. In BPPV, uh, there is no sign as such, no sign as such. Then uh, investigation of choice, in tympanometry, it is a very important MCQ and you get AS type of tympanogram. If you remember the tympanogram, I told you, only I told you the five types of tympanogram, only two are important for you. One of them, this tympanometry, AS type of tympanogram. In Minias, it is electrocochleography. Investigation of choices, electrocochleography. We graph the electrical potential of the cochlea and in this SP by AP. SP stands for summation potential, AP stands for action potential, should be more than 40 percent. This is a diagnostic criteria for Meniere's by electrocochleography. SP by AP must be more than 40 percent. Now, BPPV has a Dix Halpike maneuver. Dix Halpike maneuver is done to diagnose the uh, Dix Halpike maneuver. The name is less important, the image is very important. So, I show the image of Dix Halpike maneuver uh, in BPPV. And finally, the treatment of choice. Now, in autosclerosis, the treatment of choice is a surgery called stapedectomy or stapedotomy surgery. But if they ask for the drug of choice, if surgery cannot be done, then you have to go for sodium fluoride. Okay, either stapedectomy, which is the best option, or sodium fluoride, which might be the main drug in this patient. In Meniere's disease, there are many options they are depending on the uh, problems. I will tell you three important things. The main drug in Meniere's that you have to remember is beta histine. This is the most popular drug. It is a histaminic drug called beta histine. Remember this thing. Okay. Then there is a device called Meniere's device. Minutes device for Minutes disease, and there are many surgical options. Most of the surgeries are outdated. I'll tell you the main surgery, which is which is the latest procedure called intratympanic gentamicin. Either intratympanic gentamicin, also called medical vestibulectomy. The other name for the surgery is, or procedure is medical vestibulectomy. But we have a lot of options in Meniere's disease and in BPPV, uh, there is a maneuver called Aples maneuver. Aples maneuver for the treatment of BPPV. So see, one slide, all the important points about disease of the ear which are neither infective nor tumors, non-infective, non-tumorous disease, all the important points in this one slide in my opinion, extremely hugely useful, beneficial for last moment revision. Now, let me show you a few images of these diseases of the ear. Now, this is stapedectomy being done. Both are stapedectomy surgery. If you remember, if you can, uh, if you notice, the stapes is removed and the stapes is placed by a prosthesis here. This is the prosthesis between the, in the area of the stapes and this is the actual image 
of a prosthesis after stapedectomy surgery. So both the images are important. Will help you uh, understand what's what disease we have done this surgery for. They are done for autosclerosis. Now another image. Now this is a Dick's Hulpike maneuver being done. And Dick's Hulpike is for, as we know, diagnosis of BPPV. And if you see, there are two images because this procedure is done only once. Remember, Dick's Hulpike is done just once. So it's just what two images showing the procedure done to and fro. It is not repeated. So it's not cyclical. Dick's Hulpike. And this is Apple's maneuver. And this is cyclical. See, it is repeated many times. So you can see cycle. Apple, this is for treatment. For treatment of BPPV. Isn't it? We know this. And also remember, Apple's maneuver is a type of canalolith repositioning. Can you read this name? Canalolith repositioning maneuver. Apple's maneuver is a type of canalolith repositioning maneuver. Remember this name? It is done for a BPPV. Okay. So these are some of the images of uh, uh, these diseases that we discussed. And the last topic of year are assistive device for hearing. What is the meaning of assistive device for hearing? It means devices that help you improve the hearing of the patient who has a hearing loss. And there are three devices, hearing aid, cochlear implant, brain stem implant. These are the three devices. Now two points only. Hearing aid is an amplifier of sound. That means it makes the sound louder. And loud sounds are heard better by anybody. So if you make the sound loud, obviously the patient will hear better. And this can be used for any hearing loss. Any hearing loss, you can use this too. Whereas these two are not amplifier, they are speech processor. It's a different kind of technology. And they are used for bilateral severe hearing loss only. HL is hearing loss. Unlike a uh, 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 hearing aid which can be used for any hearing loss, these two are used only for severe hearing loss. Now cochlear implant, CI stands for, has electrodes. <coughs> One of the part of the cochlear implant is electrode and this is implanted This is very important. Into scala tympani. Now, for those who know, cochlea has three compartments: scala vestibuli, scala media, scala tympani. So, this is inserted in the scala tympani of cochlea through what is the root? The root is the round window. Okay, so both these names are important, scala tympani and round window. They are very important names, very commonly asked. So, scala tympani and round window. Popular names. So, this much about the uh, devices only. And these are the two uh, images. The first one is a hearing aid, a special hearing aid which is bone anchored, fixed onto the bone as you can see, it's called Baha. You know what is the full form of Baha? Bone anchored hearing aid. The name tells you bone anchored hearing aid. And the second one is a cochlear implant. So sometimes people get confused between these two types of instrument, hearing aid and cochlear implant. So just try to remember the images. And this will complete ear. Ear is done. See, in just 1 hour 20 minutes, we have completed every topic of the year. Can you beat that? And every topic we have touched. We have not left anything untouched, almost. Isn't it? Throat. Pharynx. Now, I draw the pharynx like this. This is the face from the side view 
and this entire posterior column is the pharynx. This posterior column is the pharynx is divided into three parts. This top part is called the nasopharynx. The middle part is the oropharynx. And the lower part, this one I am writing here is the laryngopharynx. So we have nasopharynx, oropharynx and laryngopharynx, the three parts of the pharynx. Okay. Now we will talk about individually nasopharynx, oropharynx and laryngopharynx in that sequence. But in the nasopharynx, the most important things are adenoid and adenoid can lead to adenoid hypertrophy and adenoid hypertrophy can lead to uh, adenoid phases. And this is a very, very important point that what are the features of adenoid phases which is due to adenoid hypertrophy. Now, adenoid hypertrophy can cause glue ear also, but glue ear we have discussed already in uh, ear. These are the features of adenoid phases. There are five features of adenoid phases and they are very, very important. You must remember the five features of adenoid phases. Now, if you have noticed this and if you know this, the first two are the features of the ear uh, in the mouth they are seen in the mouth high arch palate and crowded upper teeth uh, second and the third the third and the fourth next two are features of the uh, nose collapsed ally in the nose and the hyperplastic medulla and the last one is a general feature on the face which is dull expression okay uh, Abhiram, Krish, uh, uh, this you have to talk to the technical team. It will remain for some time, that is definitely, but how long it will stay is difficult to say. But it is going to stay for some time, definitely. Right. So, these are the features of adenoid phases. Now, if in the nasopharynx, besides this, when I draw the anatomy of the nasopharynx, there is a eustachian tube like this, station tube, behind the tube there is a bulge called torus tubaris, there is a bulge here called torus tubaris and at the top there is adenoid and this is the tonsil and the hypertrophy of the adenoid is going to cause glue ear and the adenoid faces that I have just talked about. This is the adenoid faces. Okay. Now let us start first the tumors of the throat, benign tumor, malignant tumors. These are the two most tumors are the most popular disease of the throat. The most important topics are the four tumors, two benign. And after this, we will talk about two malignant tumors. So, which are the two benign tumors? Juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibroma and laryngeal papilloma, the two most important benign tumors of the throat. Very, very important. Now, you know, interestingly, both are seen in juvenile age group. The first one is seen in juvenile males, and the second one is seen in juvenile. is both male and female. So, second one is not strictly male, uh, but both are juvenile, uh, juvenile age group. So, both as tumors are seen in children. The site, very, very important. Uh, angiofibroma is seen in a site called sphenoplatine foramen. Laryngeal papilloma is most commonly seen in the glottis. Glottis is the most common site, but it can be seen in other part of the larynx also. <coughs> okay, then presentation. Juvenile angiofibroma 
presence as a male child with recurrent and severe epistaxis. So, if a male child has a bleeding from the nose, especially if it is severe and recurrent, the only thing that should come to mind is this one, juvenile angiofibroma. Whereas, laryngeal papilloma, a child, this time it is neither male nor female, it is child, it could be any, with hoarseness. Obviously, larynx disease causes hoarseness, mainly plus minus dyspnea, difficulty in breathing. Right? Now, cause... Uh, you don't have to know the cause of angiofibroma or let's say male hormones, testosterone, you can remember that. But papilloma is very important, it's caused by human papilloma virus 6 and human papilloma virus 11. Now this is the most important MCQ from laryngeal papilloma, the cause of laryngeal papilloma human papilloma virus 6 and 11 and finally uh, treatment angiofibroma is a vascular disease tumor so treatment is like glomus tumor that we discussed which is embolization followed by surgical excision is the treatment the best treatment for juvenile angiofibroma whereas laryngeal papilloma the treatment is called Micro debridement or CO2 laser. So, this is the surgery we do either micro debridement or CO2 laser plus intra lesional injection of either pseudofovir or acyclovir. These are antivirals. Obviously, it is caused by virus. So, antivirals are given inside the tumor. Intralesional means we inject inside the tumor intralesional injections of antiviral like acyclovir and pseudofovir. Now, one point I forgot to tell you about angiofibroma uh, signs. Angiofibroma has two signs. One is called frog face and the other is called antral sign. So, these two signs are very popular signs in angiofibroma. See, just four, two, three points about angiofibroma, two, three points about papilloma and we have all the important tumors of the throat done. So, remember these points which are simple but important points. Now, let me show you the image of antral sign. These are antral sign images also called Holman Miller sign. This is the other name, Holman Miller sign. And if you notice in this sign, in the CT scan, the posterior wall of maxilla is pushed by the tumor. The red arrow, the red arrow is showing you that the posterior wall of the maxilla is pushed by the tumor. And this is called the antral sign. Okay, that. So, these are the benign tumors and then we talk about, uh, this is the laryngeal papilloma. Papillomas in any part of the body, they look the same. So, they are multiple papillometers in a group, we sometimes describe like a bunch of grapes, they look like papillomas, this is how they look like. Then we talk about carcinomas of the nasopharynx and carcinoma of the larynx. Nasopharyngeal carcinoma is more important than laryngeal carcinoma. In laryngeal carcinoma, the only important thing you have to know is the treatment of laryngeal carcinoma. But nasopharyngeal carcinoma, there are other points like the site. What is the site of nasopharyngeal carcinoma? Any idea? It's Foss of Rosenmuller. And laryngeal carcinoma, again, glottis is the most common site. What is the cause? Nasopharyngeal carcinoma can be many causes. I will tell you two. 
one it can be called by epstein bar virus it's a viral cause and it can be called by a chemical called nitrosamine these are the two important things that can lead to or cause the nasopharyngeal carcinoma laryngeal carcinoma is caused by smoking mainly this everybody knows most people know smoking is the other things also like as, uh, alcohol and asbestosis but smoking is the number one cause of laryngeal carcinoma then most common complaint presentation and uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma this is a very important mcq because if you don't know the answer you can't even guess what is the most common presentation it's called cervical lymph adenopathy the cervical lymph node is enlarged and there is something very important called trotter's triad this is another very important thing they ask you and because it's a triad there are three features and they ask you what are the three features of trotter's triad in nasopharyngeal carcinoma one is soft palate palsy second is facial pain and hearing loss okay so these are the three features of trotter's triad soft palate palsy facial pain and hearing loss in this patient now carcinoma i don't have to tell you anything in the vocal cord has to be hoarseness plus minus difficulty in breathing dyspnea is the most common complaint and finally the treatment of choice this is very simple in uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma chemo radiation just one line question answer chemo radiation is the treatment of choice now in laryngeal carcinoma the treatment is a little more complicated it depends on stage and each stage has many options but actually the most common option in stage 1 and stage 2 if they ask you the best treatment you say transoral laser microsurgery this is the simplest answer transoral laser microsurgery is the treatment of choice for stage 1 stage 2 carcinoma of the larynx and if it is stage 3 4 any 4 a b c the stage 4 a b c the simplest answer of course there is lot of uh, details in that we are not going to go into the details for you simple is concurrent chemo radiation of course surgery and all also options but this is the best option if concurrent chemo radiation is given in stage 3 4a and 4b and 4c that's the correct now look in nasopharyngeal carcinoma there is no word concurrent concurrent means together chemotherapy and radiotherapy are both done at the same time is concurrent and but in stage 1 and 2 there is transoral laser micro again see one table all the important points about this carcinoma that you have to know so we done all the tumors the most important topic in the throat are these tumors and then we go beyond and talk about other things like tonsillitis in tonsillitis only two or three points one is basically we are talking about tonsils the main arteries of the tonsil you know how many arteries supply the tonsil is a very very popular question the five arteries and the main artery is tonsillar branch of facial artery in one of the question papers last year not your question in one of the question papers of last year uh, this was a question that which is the main artery of the tonsil tonsil branch of facial artery so it can be a important mcq for you then there are two ascending arteries two ascending and both start with the letter p one is ascending pharyngeal and ascending palatine and the third one is opposite of this opposite of ascending is descending 
again palatine so the two palatines one is ascending palatine one is descending palatine and one the fifth one comes from the tongue so it's called lingual or dorsal lingual artery okay so these are the arteries of the tonsil now tonsillitis which is inflammation of the tonsil the most common type is the cataral tonsillitis caused by adenovirus so it's a viral tonsillitis and the second most common cause is strep pyogenes strep pyogenes is the second most common cause of tonsillitis but adenovirus is the most common cause of infection of the tonsil and the last thing about tonsillitis you have to know is the uh, surgery tonsillectomy two points only most common indication of tonsillectomy surgery you have to remember one two two names here either recurrent tonsillitis and chronic tonsillitis see there are many indications the list is very long but these are the two most common indications for tonsillectomy surgery so remember these two names and second is most common complication and most of you know this isn't it it's a very simple question bleeding hemorrhage this is the most common complication of tonsillectomy bleeding from the tonsil or hemorrhage now bleeding of tonsil during tonsillectomy is a very 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 important topic i'll tell you two or three points which you should remember it's an extremely important thing now bleeding of tonsillectomy can be divided into three types one is called primary bleeding one is called reactionary bleeding and secondary bleeding now i'm sure you know that primary bleeding is bleeding during the surgery at the time of surgery while you are doing the surgery the bleeding happens is called primary bleeding and the source is venous bleed remember this primary bleeding of the tonsil is venous bleed and the first thing you do is apply pressure to control the bleed the first thing of course if the pressure fails then you have to do cautery and ligation but apply pressure is the first thing that you should do to stop the primary bleeding of tonsillectomy for 5 to 10 minutes and most of the bleeding stops just by applying pressure during tonsillectomy surgery which is from the veins now reactionary bleeding is within 24 hours of surgery the surgery is over if the bleeding happens within the 24 hours after the surgery it's reactionary bleeding and this is due to slippage of ligature the ligature that has been applied the suture which you have tied has slipped it has come out and that is the cause of secondary bleeding and now it's a very important mcq what is the treatment for secondary bleeding is a very very popular mcq immediate religation and religation is done under general anesthesia so immediate religation under general anesthesia is the treatment for this and then there is secondary bleeding which happens usually between fifth and eighth day of surgery five to eight day after the surgery the secondary bleeding happens due to infection and because it is due to infection the main thing is antibiotics obviously for infection you have to give antibiotics now this particular table or slide is containing everything about tonsils that you have to know so very important table lot of points to remember uh, and you don't have to read all the tonsillitis everything in details if you know this you know all the highlights of the tonsillitis so lot of points to remember in this particular slide okay the name of the artery is the causes of the tonsillitis and about the indications contraindications and the bleedings of tonsillectomy surgery right then few other diseases related to tonsil and oropharynx one of them is quincy this is quincy image 
also called peritonsillar abscess quincy or peritonsillar abscess is caused by strep pyogenes if you remember tonsillitis also although the main cause of tonsillitis is uh, adenovirus viral tonsillitis but the second most common cause is same pathogen strep pyogenes also quincy because quincy is usually seen after tonsillitis it's a result of tonsillitis now the pus collects between two structures it collects between the capsule of the tonsil and bed of tonsil now the bed of the tonsil is formed by superior constrictor muscle this is another question that in quincy where is the blood a pus so as i said here the pus in quincy is between the capsule and the bed and the bed is superior constrictor muscle two more points a uh, quincy is compared to a hot potato condition why is quincy compared to a hot potato condition because the pain of quincy is enormous very very severe pain intolerable pain so it is called a hot potato condition the image is very easy to identify this disease and the second the most important question is the treatment most of you know the treatment for quincy what is it anybody wants to write the treatment for quincy let's see if you know the answer it's immediate incision and drainage followed by interval tonsillectomy this is the treatment immediate incision and drainage followed by interval tonsillectomy and interval tonsillectomy is a tonsillectomy done after a gap of 6 to 8 weeks so right now you do incision drainage and after 6 or 8 weeks you'll do a tonsillectomy this tonsillectomy is called interval tonsillectomy quincy image is important these few points a very similar disease in the uh, floor of the mouth called ranula now the def uh, the definition of ranula is given here ranula is called the retention cyst of sublingual gland the image is important the definition is important and the treatment marsupialization that's the treatment for ranula marsupialization that's it about ranula so this will complete most of the important of the disease of the oropharynx and nasopharynx and then we start with larynx so we have done nasopharynx disease we have done oropharynx larynx we are studying but larynx benign tumor and malignant tumor laryngeal laryngeal carcinoma laryngeal papilloma those things we have done already so we are just going to discuss other disease of the larynx like laryngomalacia is the most common congenital disease of larynx and in this a newborn child has inspiratory stridor stridor during inspiration only there is no stridor during expiration when the child is breathing out there is no stridor the child has stridor only when the child is breathing in but in this disease the most important mcq is the laryngoscopy finding and most of you know it's described as omega shaped epiglottis isn't it laryngoscopy finding is omega shaped epiglottis very very important this one and treatment you don't have to do anything in this patient so it's called reassurance you have to give assurance to the parent of the child which is like a conservative management reassurance is like a conservative management laryngomalacia so only these points about laryngomalacia and the image is important how does the omega shaped epiglottis look like and this is the omega shaped epiglottis what do you do when this when you see this image on laryngoscopy reassurance nothing isn't it that's what we do okay the only important congenital disease of the larynx is this one and then vocal cord palsy another very important topic now most common cause there are two causes and it's controversial the better answer for you is thyroidectomy 
and some books is idiopathic. Both are correct answers. Uh, if thyroidectomy is given, that should be a better answer. Otherwise, you can go for idiopathic. If thyroidectomy is not given, then of course, idiopathic could be a complete answer. Now, vocal cord palsy is a very difficult topic. It's a controversial topic. There are a lot of controversies in different books. But I'll give you one table. And this table will have all the important points about vocal cord palsy that you need to know. You have to know only five points, uh, sorry, four points about vocal cord palsy. Only four points, but they're very, very important points. All the four points. Okay. Now, there are two types. So, I made two columns because there are two types of vocal cord palsy. One is called abductor palsy. And the other has to be adductor palsy. Okay. So, what are these uh, four points about this abductor palsy and adductor palsy of the vocal cord? Number one, the cause. What is the cause of these two? Abductor palsy is due to recurrent laryngeal nerve damage. Damage of the recurrent laryngeal nerve causes abductor palsy. And what causes adductor palsy? Due to vagus nerve damage. So, vagus damage causes adductor palsy. So, this is the first thing that which nerve will cause abductor palsy, which nerve will, will cause adductor palsy. It's a very, very important thing. And there are three more points. Now, before I talk about three more points, let me tell you, both can be divided into unilateral palsy and bilateral palsy. Same here, it can be unilateral palsy or bilateral adductor palsy. Obviously, if one side nerve is damaged, it's unilateral palsy. If both sides nerves are damaged, bilateral adductor palsy. So, in a way, you can say that we have four types of vocal cord palsies. I can divide here into two groups. I can divide this also into two types. So, one thing I told you, you have to know four things. One thing you know already is the name abductor, what is abductor palsy, what is abductor palsy. Then, what is the position of the vocal cord in each of them? Position. In first one, it's unilateral paramedian position. The vocal cord comes in a paramedian position. In the second one, it has to be bilateral paramedian. Is this not logical? The nerve is the same, recurrent nerve palsy, both are recurrent nerve palsy, one side and two sides, so the position is the same. In the third one, it's unilateral cadaveric position and bilateral cadaveric position. So, this is the position, unilateral paramedian. So, one of the two positions, either paramedian or cadaveric. Only two positions, so it's easy to remember. Then the main complaint. In the first one, the main complaint is hoarseness of voice, hoarseness, voice change. Very interestingly, the voice becomes normal without any problem on its own, without treatment. Within few days, the voice becomes normal. So, it is not a long term problem. Then the second one, dyspnea is the main problem. Dyspnea is difficulty in breathing. And this can be dangerous with good voice. So, voice in this case is good. Breathing is a main problem. In the third one, uh, hoarseness is the main complaint. Plus minus aspiration. And the last one, aspiration is the main complaint. Where the patient aspirates which can be life threatening. Plus aphonia. Aphonia is complete loss of voice. Okay. So, we know the names, the cause, we know the position, we know the complaint. And the last thing, the fourth thing is the surgery that we do. What are the surgeries? Now, surgeries are very, very, very important. Remember these surgeries that I am going to tell you. In the first one, we do no surgery. Obviously, if the voice has become normal, why will I do surgery? Isn't it? So, no surgery is done. In the second one, I will tell you three or four names. One is tracheostomy. 
tracheostomy, very very important surgery done for <coughs> abductor palsy. Second surgery you have to know is called type 2 thyroplasty. Now, type 2 thyroplasty is also called lateralization of vocal cord. This is vocal cord. So, you pull the vocal cord laterally. So, that is called lateralization of vocal cord. The third surgery is a very popular name, Kashima's operation. And the fourth surgery of is called chordoplasty. The other surgeries also, but I want to remember these four popular names. These are the surgeries which are still very commonly done for a uh, dyspnea in bilateral abductor. They are done for dyspnea in bilateral abductor. So remember the names of these surgeries. Okay. So if you are making notes, please make proper notes so that you can revise them properly. Even if you have not studied ENT before, I am telling you, just make the notes and revise them and they are going to be very, very useful in the exam. Then in second one for hoarseness, we have two surgeries, type 1 thyroplasty. See, in the previous one, there was type 2 thyroplasty. This one is type 1 thyroplasty, is also called medialization. This is the only surgery that we do for type and for uh, hoarseness in this patient. But there is one more option that I will give you, uh, which is called uh, injections. This is not done anymore, but it used to be done, so sometimes it makes sense that you remember the old treatment also, injections of Teflon. And what is the surgery for aspiration in bilateral abductor palsy? It's total laryngectomy. Okay. Now, this slide is a very important slide. One of the, this contains everything on vocal cord palsy that you have to know from the exam point of view. The cause of the two palsies, the position, the main complaint and the surgeries. Especially the surgery for bilateral abductor palsy, the four names, so they can ask you this very, very commonly. Okay. And if you have noticed, we have talked about uh, type 1 thyroplasty, type 2 thyroplasty, they are type 3 and type 4 also. So, this list tells you everything about thyroplasty that you have to know. So, you realize that there are four types of thyroplasties. The first we discuss, first remember medialization is given there and it is done for adductor palsy and type 2 is lateralization done for abductor palsy, you know this already. But remember type 3 and type 4 also, type 3 we make it loose, loosen by shortening and is done for a condition called puerophonia and type 4 is opposite of type 3 where you make it lengthen or make it more tight tent it's done for androphonia now puberphonia is a male with female like voice male with female like voice and androphonia is a female with male like voice So, if a male has a female like voice, it is called puerophonia. If a female has a male like voice, it is called endrophonia. And you can do thyroplasty in these patients. And this is the list about thyroplasty that you have to do. Okay. Then we talk about inflammation of the larynx called laryngitis. So, you can see there are a lot of conditions under the heading of laryngitis. Uh, infective, non-infective, infectively acute and chronic. Okay. So, I am not going to wait for you to write down, write down this name. If you want to, after the session, you can revisit, pause this and you can write down if you are writing the names. But three are important. These three are important. So, if you cannot see this name, does not matter because they are not important. Only these three are important. The first three, the other three we will discuss. Now, acute epiglottitis in group, again we make a column like this and compare them, only the important points I will tell you about these two very important types of laryngitis, acute epiglottitis and croup. Acute epiglottitis is caused by strep pyogenes 
और स्ट्रेप निमोनी सो बोथ आर बैक्टीरिया बोथ आर स्ट्रेपोकस वन इज पाइजिन वन इज निमोनी बट क्रूप इज कॉज बाई वायरस कॉल्ड पैरा इन्फ्लुएंजा वायरस बोथ है फीवर ऑल द क्रूप द फीवर इज वेरी वेरी माइल्ड बट पॉसिबल बोथ मे हैव डिस्निया डिफिकल्ट इन ब्रीदिंग सो दीज टू कंप्लेन्स आर सेम बट द थर्ड वन इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट दर इज डिस्फेजिया इन एपिग्लोटाइटिस विच इज डिफिकल्ट इन सोलोइंग एंड क्रूप एज वॉइस चेंज दैट्स वाई दिस फीचर मे हेल्प यू डिफ्रेंशिएट बिटवीन द टू and there is one interesting feature of ketoglottitis the child is seen in what is called tripod position the child is sitting down in a position called tripod position in croup there is no position as such tripod you know what is the meaning of tripod tripod means three so the child puts both the hands on the bed the so two hands and the body supporting so that's called tripod position and now comes the most important question from this everybody knows this answer and they have asked so many times the x ray finding tell me guys what is it x ray of the epiglottitis it's described as thumb sign isn't it the x ray is also important the image i'll show you the image where is the steeple sign steeple sign was asked in the neat pg exam last year and last two, two times so they can ask you very easily i'll show you the image how they look like and drug of choice in epiglottis we give third generation cephalosporins and in croup we always do three things we give steroid to every child of croup we do nebulization and all the viral disease we still give antibiotics to prevent the supra added bacterial infection second infection prevent karne ke liye we give antibiotics okay now these are the important features of croup and epiglottitis the x rays are very important x rays of croup and epiglottitis so let me show you a thumb sign if you look at the white arrow this epiglottis is swollen like a shape of the thumb it's like this and that's why it's called thumb sign look at this image i'm removing this color thumb sign and the next image i'll show you is a steeple sign steeple sign was asked in neat pg exam so they can ask you steeple sign if you look at the second one x ray the arrow is the airway is like this and this shape is called steeple steeples are seen on the top of churches so from there you get the name the first image is trying to show you how it looks like steeple sign what to look for steeple sign okay so thumb sign steeple sign very very important in epiglottitis and croup so very important disease and tuberculosis only two points tuberculosis larynx most common site is posterior glottis posterior part of the glottis lies between the two arytenoids between the two arytenoids so interarytenoid area is called between the two arytenoids therefore it's called interarytenoid area the most common site of tuberculosis of the larynx is this one but this is less important in tuberculosis of the larynx what they ask you very common in tuberculosis of larynx are the findings and there are three findings and they are very popular mcqs these are the three findings this is not important so these three very popular mcq turban epiglottis mouse nibbled appearance cobblestone appearance remember these three very important findings of tuberculosis this is the only thing in tuberculosis of the larynx that they ask you nowadays in the exam okay and treatment of course in any every tuberculosis of any part of the body the first thing we always do is give anti tubercular therapy once we control the tuberculosis then we may have to do something else but beginning is always att anti tubercular therapy
<coughs> tuberculosis. So this will complete all the inflammation of the larynx. Then we talk about growths of the larynx. So growth as you can see can be divided into a neoplastic growth, non-neoplastic growth, Neoplastic growth can be vocal cord nodule and polyp. The other conditions also I'll they will discuss. And neoplastic growth can be laryngeal papilloma and carcinoma. Now these two papilloma and carcinoma we have already discussed. We have done them. So we have to only talk about non-neoplastic growth. Two very important are given here, but there are two more names which we'll know recently in soon. Now nodule and polyp. Again I compare them. The nodule and polyp. So, I write vocal cord nodule and vocal cord polyp and then compare them. So, same reason. It will finish off very fast and easy to remember. Now, nodule, vocal cord nodule is also called singers nodule. So, vocal cord nodule, one second, I think I will have to read open up. It's hanging, just wait for a while, guys. So once again, we'll make two columns. Vocal cord nodule and vocal cord polyp. I told you nodule is called singers nodule. What is the cause of nodule and polyp? The cause is the same. They are both used due to chronic misuse of voice. If somebody is misusing the voice too much, they have to speak too much and loudly. That is called chronic misuse of voice. Now, very important thing is the site is the same. The site of nodule polyp is the same, which is junction. This Remember this very important point of anterior one-third and posterior two-third of vocal cord. So, if I draw the vocal cord like this, I divide into three parts like this and divide into three parts, the nodule is here and here polyp is here. So, this is the junction of anti one third. Nodule is always bilateral, polyp is always unilateral and that is why I have drawn two nodules and one polyp because nodule is bilateral and polyp is unilateral. But the most important thing is the treatment of choice. In nodule, voice rest is your correct answer. Voice rest is the treatment of choice. If this fails to treat, then we do surgery. But surgery is not the first thing we do. Only if it fails by voice rest we do. And the name of the surgery is important. It is called Microlaryngeal Surgery. MLS is a short form of this microlaryngeal surgery. But there is a second option. In polyp, the treatment of choice is surgery. Surgery is the main thing. Plus minus voice rest. Voice rest is secondary. 
and what surgery you can do mls there is another surgery called micro flap technique this is the other surgery which can be done for polyp micro flap technique but micro flap technique cannot be done for nodule okay so nodule and polyp very very important non neoplastic growth of the larynx i'll tell you two more growths one of them so this is how the nodules look like see it's bilateral if you look at this image this is bilateral and they're small and white in color you also bilateral small and white in color now i'll show you the polyp look at that image it's so different compared to the nodule now this is your polyp this is a polyp and this is a polyp they are unilateral much larger and red in color like nodule was white and small this is large and red in color so uh, differentiating an image of a polyp and nodule is not very difficult it's very easy uh, if you see the image once or twice you'll be able to get the hang of it now these two images you have to differentiate because the history is the same both are chronic misuse of voice both are the same site both are smoker and all that so and the both have changed of voice so image will only help you make a diagnosis is it nodule or polyp then uh, then we talk about laryngoseal now laryngoseal is defined as ballooning or dilation of saccule this is how we define laryngoseal it's ballooning or dilation of the saccule and it's seen in trumpet blower it's seen in Who are trumpet blowers? Trumpet blowers are people who play musical instrument with the mouth, with the pressure of the mouth, and especially not we have to apply a lot of pressure. Not like the people who are playing uh, flute. Flute you don't have to apply too much of pressure. Like saxophone is a good example. You have to apply a lot of pressure because the pressure there is a lot of pressure in the larynx and the saccule dilates or balloons. And look at the image. This is how laryngoseal starts to look like. Okay, a trumpet blower with with neck swelling is a presentation. So, if a trumpet blower has a neck swelling, this is the first thing that comes to your mind. And this is the last thing, growth of the larynx. You have to know intubation granuloma has one more name, also called contact ulcer. The name is very important. Contact ulcer. And intubation and granuloma are same thing. If I ask you the cause, the name tells you the cause. The cause is in the name. It's long-term intubation. If you intubate for a long duration of time, it leads to granuloma. Look at the image. Now this is the site of intubation granuloma, which is which is the site. Is the junction of Anterior two third and posterior one third of vocal cord. This is opposite of nodule and polyp. In the nodule and polyp, the site I told you is a junction of anterior one third and posterior two third. And now I tell you anterior two third and posterior one third. So opposite of each other. Again, it looks so different from any other growth. And treatment is important. You have to do CO2 laser excision plus we have to give steroids plus we have to give Botox and plus we have to do mitomycin C. So because you have to do so many things that's why it becomes important question. Okay, so these were the growths we uh, we talked about laryngeal papilloma and laryngeal carcinoma before. And these are the four non neoplastic growth vocal cord nodule, vocal cord polyp, laryngoseal, and intubation granuloma. Okay, so this completes all the important disease of the larynx. Also, we have done nasopharynx, oropharynx, larynx, and the last topic I want to talk about is tracheostomy in the larynx. In tracheostomy, I'll tell you only three points which are important. We understand the meaning of tracheostomy. We make our opening in the trachea. The most 
common indication what is the most common indication for tracheostomy laryngeal obstruction due to laryngeal carcinoma this is the most common indication for tracheostomy surgery now which is the site of tracheostomy where do you do it it is done in ring 2 and ring 3 we have tracheal ring 1 2 3 4 like this so it is done in ring 2 and ring 3 basically we avoid ring 1 This is what we do. But if you do in ring 1, it becomes high tracheostomy. They ask you this, what is the meaning of high tracheostomy? High tracheostomy means you have done tracheostomy on the ring 1. And when it is done, there is only one disease where high tracheostomy may be required or indicated and that is carcinoma larynx. Carcinoma of larynx is the only indication for high tracheostomy. And the last thing is most common complication. There are two complications of tracheostomy is a common. One is dislodgement of the tube. What is the meaning of dislodgement of tube? The tracheostomy tube comes out and that can be very dangerous. The patient may die. You have put a tube to save the life so that the patient can breathe. Suppose it comes out, dislodgement, it is a life threatening situation, isn't it? And bleeding is the second most common complaint. There are other complications also, but these are the two common complications of tracheostomy. So, just two or three points of tracheostomy and that should be enough. Okay. Now, this completes throat all the important points. We have done uh, ear all the points, we have done throat all the point and finally, nose and sinuses is a very simple topic. Uh, there are not many big topics, so we will finish off quite fast in this. Now, in the nose, Two walls are important, septum and lateral wall. So, we will start off nasal septum. This is how the nasal septum looks like. Nasal septum has many bones and many cartilages, but you should be able to identify three. You should be able to identify the vomer bone, this one, the perpendicular plate of ethmoid bone, this one and septal cartilage. If you can identify these three things in the septum, that is sufficient for you to, for the exam point of view. They will not ask any other thing to identify in the nasal septum usually. Right. Now, in the nasal septum, the most important things are the arteries. Now, this is important. There are five arteries. Remember, in the tonsil also we have five arteries. Now, three out of five, they carry the blood from external carotid artery and two out of five carry the blood from internal carotid artery. Now, this is the first important thing that nose or septum has supply from both the carotids. There are very few part of the body which has supply from both the carotid. Septum is one of them. And which is the main artery of the septum? It is called sphenopalatine artery. Then there is greater palatine artery. And there is superior labial artery. Now these three arteries, they are carrying the blood from the external carotid as you know already through, not directly through other branches also. And the next two, are anti-ethmoidal and post-ethmoidal. Okay, so these are the five arteries that supplies the nose or the septum and five arteries in the tonsil also. What is very important, the first four, these four out of five, not this one, they join together to form a plexus called Kieselbeck's plexus. This is the most important thing about the artery that they 
four out of five they join each other to form a plexus called Kieselbeck's plexus, and the area which has the plexus is called the Little's area. And Little's area is important because the most common site of epistaxis. So this is a very very important point which is the most common site of epistaxis, little area or kisselbeck. Epistaxis you know is nasal bleeding, bleeding from the nose is called epistaxis. So the most common site is little area or kisselbeck plexus, and the most common artery is this phenoplatin artery. Obviously that is the main source of bleeding in this case. Right. Now what is the cause of epistaxis? Two important causes. Nose picking is the most common cause. Nose picking, where the patient has a habit of putting the finger in the nose again and again, so that's called nose picking. That causes trauma. Trauma. So if nose picking is not given, trauma is a correct answer, accepted. But some books is idiopathic. No known cause. Both are correct answer, but nose picking is a better answer. Trauma is the second best answer. And if nose picking or trauma is not given, then you can go for idiopathic. Now, what is the treatment for nasal bleeding? The first thing you do is apply pressure. If you remember, in tonsil bleed also, the first thing that we did is you apply pressure. If this fails, we do cautery with silver nitrate. It is a chemical and this is a very important MCQ. That was the chemical we use for nasal cautery, silver nitrate, very, very important. If this fails, we do nasal packing. We pack the nose. And the last is ligation of sphenoplatine artery. Obviously, sphenoplatine artery is the main artery that bleeds. So, we have to ligate the sphenoplatin artery in case of nasal bleeding epistaxis. So, epistaxis or nasal bleeding is a very very important topic and these are the important points about this very popular topic. Nasal topics, most of them are very simple small topics, few points here and there like this one, okay, epistaxis. So, everything about epistaxis which are important relevant is here. So, all this then lateral wall of the nose has the their turbinates and nostrils. We are not talking about that. Now has opening of sinuses. Has opening of sinuses. And this is what they ask you: which sinus open in which meatus of the lateral wall? So, maxillary sinus frontal sinus and ethmoidal sinus these three sinuses they open their ostia in the middle meatus then posterethmoidal sinus and sphenoid sinus. Where do they have the opening or the ostia? Posterior sinus has the ostia in the superior meatus. And sphenoid sinus has the opening in the sphenoethmoidal recess. Sphenoethmoidal recess is the other name for supreme meatus. Sphenoethmoidal recess and supreme meatus are same thing. Okay. So, which sinus ostia opens where is a very simple logical thing, but it is very commonly asked when they want to ask you a simple question, this is what they ask. So, these are the main things in the lateral wall, the sinus ostia, which sinus ostia, which meatus. There is one more important thing on the lateral wall, nasolacrimal duct. 
Now, nasolacrimal duct has nothing to do with sinus, but it's present in the lateral wall, so we have to mention. Now, what do you have to know about nasolacrimal duct? Two or three points. It opens in inferior meatus. See? We have middle meter something, we have superior meter something, we have supreme meter something. Now we have inferior meters or something. Inferior meters has the opening of the nasolacrimal duct. Now, very important question about nasolacrimal duct is the direction. The direction is downwards, backwards, and outwards. And it may form, so this is the direction downwards, backwards, and outwards. And it may form a cyst called nasolabial cyst. And this is a very important MCQ also. Where does the nasolabial cyst originate from or arise from? Remember, nasolabial cyst originates or arises from the nasolacrimal duct. As is given. So, this will tell you. Uh, importance of every meatus of the lateral part of the nose, inferior meatus, middle meatus, superior meatus, supreme meatus, which is also called sphenoethmoidal recess. So, every important point is given in this slide. So, this will complete all the important points related to the anatomy of the nose. I have talked about all this already. Then we talk about the inflammation of the nose and the inflammation of the sinus called rhinosinusitis. There are many types of rhinosinusitis. Four important are given here. An infective rhinosinusitis can be viral, fungal, and bacterial. So, I will tell you only the important highlights of this. Only two are important out of the lot, fungal and atrophic. These are the only two important, but I will tell you one or two extra points. Like vasomotor rhinitis, one of the treatment is VDN neurectomy. This is a high high yield point. We cut the VDN nerve because VDN nerve is the cause of this vasomotor rhinitis. And so in vasomotor rhinitis, you have to excise or cut the VDN nerve. That's the only thing. Atrophic rhinitis. You have to know three or four very very important point. A it has other name. What is the other name? Oziana. They ask you, you know, which of the following disease is also called Oziana? Atrophic rhinitis is also called Oziana. Then what is the most common cause? Now atrophic rhinitis can be caused by many conditions. There are four or five conditions that can cause atrophic rhinitis. The most common cause is decrease estrogen. So, very important point that decrease estrogen is the most common cause of atrophic rhinitis. And what are the main features? Roomy cavity. You know what is the meaning of roomy cavity? The space in the nose has increased because obviously atrophy means the wall become thin. If the wall will become thin, the space will become more. So that's called roomy cavity. And there's something called merciful anosmia. Merciful anosmia, very, very popular MCQ. They ask you this that merciful anosmia is a feature of which disease? Merciful anosmia is a feature of atrophic rhinitis. It means the patient has foul smell from the nose. Patient has a very foul smell from the nose in this condition. So, if you stand in the front of the patient, you will feel a very bad smell. But patient has anosmia, loss of sense of smell. So, patient does not know this. Although patient has foul smell from the nose, patient is not aware of that because patient has anosmia. So, this combination is called merciful anosmia. Then in the treatment of atrophic rhinitis, there is a very important treatment called alkaline nasal douche. Alkaline nasal douche 
is a very popular treatment for atrophic rhinitis and they ask you this very commonly. Now, dosh is a Russian word which means shower or cleaning. So, we clean the nose with the alkaline solution. That's why I call, call alkaline nasal dosh. And the question they ask you that alkaline nasal dosh or solution has three salts of sodium. Sodium, sodium, sodium. And how do you remember the three sorts of sodium? First, BBC. The first, B stands for bicarbonate. So, one salt is sodium bicarbonate. Second is sodium biborate. And the third is sodium chloride. Now, when you mix three, these three salts in water, it becomes alkaline nasal solution. And with this, you have to clean the nose regularly. And this is called alkaline nasal douche. A very important MCQ is the content of alkaline nasal solution. This is one treatment important. The other one is a surgery called Young's operation. So, another important name they ask you is Young's operation is done for which disease? Young's operation is done for atrophic rhinitis. So, three or four points about atrophic rhinitis, OGNA, merciful anosmia, roomy cavity, content of alkaline nasal solution, which is sodium bicarbonate, biborate chloride and Young's operation. These are the kind of questions you have to know. Then one or two points about uh, fungal rhinosinusitis. These are the four important fungal disease of the nose that you have to know. Aspergillosis, permanent fungal sinusitis, mucormycosis, also called rhino orbito cerebral mucormycosis, and allergic fungal sinusitis. So, four fungal diseases. Now, you know why is fungal sinusitis becoming important after COVID? Suddenly, it has suddenly become more important because I am sure you know during COVID, a lot of patient has uh, fungal infections, especially mucormycosis, the third one. But let us know very, very important, just two or three points about all of them. Very quickly, we'll finish off. Aspergillosis is the most common fungal disease of the nose. It is caused by aspergillus fumigatus. And there is a formation of a ball of fungus. What is the ball of fungus called? Aspergilloma. So, basically, in aspergillosis, there is a formation of aspergilloma, which is a ball of fungus. And the treatment is surgical excision of the fungal ball. Surgical excision is done. That's it. This name is important because the, the most common fungus of the nose is this one. That's why it is important. Now, fulminant fungal sinusitis is also caused by Aspergillus fumigatus, like this one, and mucormycosis is caused by a rhizopus. A rhizopus. But both these diseases are seen in diabetics. Because in diabetics, there is a immunity of the patient is decreased, immunity, immunocompromised status, and so both can infect. Both are highly invasive. And both the drug of choice is the same, which is liposomal amphotericin B. plus surgery. You have to do surgery also. But the drug of choice is important which is liposomal and potassium B is used for both this condition. Now, these points about mucormycosis and fulminant sinusitis are the same. Mucormycosis has one more important feature. It can cause black necrosis of the tissue and this necrosis tissue is called black fungus, black tissue. So, I will show you the image of how a black fungus looks like, what it means. But you must have heard this name black fungus during COVID. This is the other name for mucormycosis because of necrosis, the tissue becomes black and that's why it's called black fungus. But before showing the image, one or two points about allergic fungal sinusitis. 
is the allergy to the fungus. Now, any allergy is type 1 hypersensitivity. So, this allergy is also type 1 hypersensitivity. And there are many criteria. How does it present? There is nasal polyp with calcium deposits. This is one thing. Nasal polyp has calcium inside. That is a very common presentation. And now this can be seen on a CT scan. When you see a polyp and a calcium CT scan, polyp and calcium, they have different densities. So, in a CT scan, you see two different densities and this is called double density scan. This is the most important feature of allergic fungal sinusitis. There is a double density CT scan. Why double density? You can see two different densities. One is a poly, one is a calcium. Okay. I will show you the image of double density, but treatment steroids plus PES surgery. PES is the name of a surgery which stands for functional endoscopic sinus surgery. F is functional, E is endoscopic, S is sinus, S is surgery, functional endoscopic. So, we do a surgery with the help of the endoscope in the nose. Now, these are the important points or highlights of the fungal sinusitis that you have to know. Now, two images I have to show you. One is the black fungus. Now, this is how a black fungus of mucormycosis looks like because the tissue has become deep black in color so it's called black fungus and this is a double density the second one is a double density scan double density means allergic fungal sinusitis now look at the three CT scans the first one is normal normal scan this is how the normal everything is black, black, black. So there is air inside the sinuses, no disease, absolutely. Second is a normal polyp. That means single density. This is your polyp. If you look at this polyp, the density of the polyp is same throughout. This is the same density, single density scan. And second is the third is a double density scan. There is a these white things are calcium deposits. This the whole thing is a polyp. But in this polyp, the dark polyp, these white things are the calcium. So, you see in this polyp, there are two densities and that is why it is called double density. So, if you compare the middle one and the third one, both are polyps, but one is single density, normal polyp, one is double density, polyp of allergic fungal sinusitis. So, very, very important image. Uh, the moment you see the CT scan, last one I am talking about, you can diagnose uh, allergic fungal sinusitis. That is why that is a very, very important image that you must know. Okay. So, this much about the rhinosinusitis you have to know. And then we talk about nasal polyps. Nasal polyps which are also seen in allergic fungal sinusitis but the polyp of allergic fungal sinusitis has calcium in it. A normal polyp does not have calcium. I have shown you the CT scan just now. Isn't it? Now, they have poor blood supply. and poor nerve supply. Now tell me, if the polyp of poor blood supply, the color has to be pale, isn't it? Then they do not bleed and if it does not have the blood supply, nerve supply, they are painless. So you can see, that these are the three features of nasal polyp, the fact that they are pale in color, they do not bleed and they are painless. Now, the cause, most common cause, allergy is the most common cause of nasal polyp. That is why in allergic fungal sinusitis, there is a nasal polyp but with calcium. Otherwise, usually polyps, they are due to allergy but without calcium. But there are three syndromes which may have polyps in it. 
which are the three syndromes with polyp in it? These three syndromes. Now, in polyps, this is the only thing they will ask you in the exam. Which are the syndromes, polyp, and what are the features of the syndrome, three syndromes? So, we have Samter's triad, we have Carter Gainer syndrome, and we have Young's syndrome. There are three features. Samter's triad has three things ethmoidal polyp, asthma, and aspirin sensitivity. So, polyp has to be there. This was asked in your last paper in your last year paper 22 this was the question there that what are the features of samtas triad then this cartagener syndrome again there has to be poly but along with poly there is bronchiectasis and situs inverses leading to dextrocardia you know the meaning of dextrocardia the heart is on the opposite side the whole thing is left structures on the right side right body structures on the left side ulta dextrocardia and Young syndrome, again three features, polyp has to be there, bronchitis, bronchitis and polyp are seen in this and bronchitis and polyp are seen in cartagenous also. So these two features of cartagenous and Young are same, bronchitis and polyp. So what differentiates is situs inverses versus azuspermia, azuspermia in this case and situs inverses and dextrocardia in the previous one. So these three uh, uh, syndromes with polyp very very important. And young syndrome, do not confuse with young surgery, young surgery is done for atrophic rhinitis. So these are the only features of a, about a nasal polyps that you have to know. And then difference between ethmoidal polyp and maxillary polyp, not very important. One or two things, maxillary polyp has one more, two more names, it is called antroconal polyp. I hope you can read this name, antroconal polyp and Killian's polyp. Now, both these names are important and they could be MCQ also for polyps. Whereas, ethmoidal polyp is called bunch of grapes. Right. Look at maxillary polyp is seen in children. It is caused to infection. It is unilateral. It is single and it is not recurrent. Now, if you look at ethmoidal polyp, everything is opposite. Everything that's the interesting point. Maxillary polyp is not all ulti, egg them opposite. So, maxillary polyp is children, this is adult. Maxillary polyp is due to infection, this is allergy. Maxillary polyp is unilateral, this is bilateral. Maxillary polyp is singular, this is multiple. That's why it's called bunch of grapes. And maxillary polyp is not recurrent, this one is recurrent. So, maxillary polyp and ethmoidal polyp absolutely old, ultra opposite, and that's why it is easy to remember also. And if they ask you which are the features of maxillary polyp, which are the features of ethmoidal polyp, it's very easy to answer such questions. Okay, so this was about polyps in the nose. The next topic is DNS. This image is debated nasal septum. Only two or three points. You know the meaning of DNS, debated nasal septum. You can see the image, you can make out very easily the septum is not straight, it is debated. What is the most common presentation complaint? Nasal obstruction. Nasal block. Now you know what is important about nasal obstruction in DNS that you have to know. Which side of the patient nose will have obstruction? So you have to say that obstruction is mainly on same side. the same side as DNS is obviously this the DNS at that side is less space sometimes on opposite side also this is important mainly on the same side but sometimes on the opposite side also very important now why on the opposite side this is very important why it is due to compensatory hypertrophy of inferior turbinate. This is another question that why should the opposite side of DNS have obstruction 
and the answer is it's this is due to compensatory hypertrophy of the inferior turbinate so this is one complaint you have to remember obstruction on same side or opposite side the second complaint you have to remember headache you know why headache is important because headache of dns is a name it's called anterior ethmoidal syndrome so headache of dns is called anterior ethmoidal syndrome that's why it is important so these are the two complaints out of many that you have to remember obstruction same side opposite side and anterior ethmoidal syndrome now in dns you don't have to investigate it's a clinical diagnosis look at the image and you can make out the diagnosis very easily looking at the image but they ask you about this test which is called cottle's test Cottle's test is done for DNS. That's all. The image is important. Treatment of choice. Septoplasty is the treatment of choice. The second option is submucosal resection. It's called SMR in short. So many times we read this word SMR in septum or DNS, which stands for submucosal resection. So two surgical options in DNS. Two things you have to know that septoplasty, the incision we give is called Freer's incision. And in SMR, the incision is called Killian's incision. So name of the incision could be important. So this is one point, the name of the incision for septoplasty and SMR. And the second point you have to know is that both these surgeries are done after 17 years of age. So we don't do these two surgeries, SMR and septoplasty in a child less than 17 years. Why? Because septum is not complete before this age. So we always wait for the completion of the growth of the septum. We let the septum complete the growth and then we do these two surgeries after the completion of the growth. Okay. So the names of the incisions are very, very important. Septoplasty SMR. So this was about DNS only. And then we talk about four important diseases or three diseases. Uh, this is a patient of rhinophyma. And the only thing you have to know, the other name is called potato nose. The skin of the nose becomes thick and ugly due to, it is due to hypertrophy of sebaceous gland. So it is due to hypertrophy of the sebaceous gland and it's rhinophyma, it's a spot diagnosis. They will give you the image like this, the nose is big and ugly. And they ask you the diagnosis, either rhinophyma or potato nose, given the choices, easy to diagnose. A very similar name, rhinoscleroma. Look at the image, there is a sclerosis of the nose. Three points here. It's also called woody nose. So rhinophyma was called potato nose. This is called woody nose. The cause is important. It's a bacterial disease caused by Klebsiella rhinoscleromatis. Which is also called Pris bacilli. So this is the one, th this is one thing. The pathogen that causes rhinoscleroma. The name is easy rhinoscleromatis. Woody knows. And the second thing is the histopathology examination finding. This is the most important MCQ very commonly asked. There are two types of cells on histopathology. One is called Mikulis cell and the other is called Russell body. Mikulis cell Russell body very important MCQ for this disease. And rarely they may ask you the drug of choice which is streptomycin.
Some books say rifampicin is better, but it's mainly streptomycin. So three or four points. Pay attention to the histopathology, Mucosal Russell body, very very important. Rhinos scleroma. And the last disease of this category, rhinosporidiosis. Again, an infective disease caused by rhinosporidium siberi. So that was much bacteria. This is a different kind of pathogen. It's a protozoa, aquatic protozoa. So because it is aquatic protozoa, it grows in the collected waters near sea coast, coastal area, and all that. But the most common question they ask is how does it present? Look at the image, and this is described as strawberry polyp. Why is called strawberry polyp? Deep red in color, like a strawberry. If you look at the image, also you can make out strawberry polyp. And again, drug of choice. This time it is dapson. Dapson is otherwise given in leprosy, but is given to rhinosporidiosis also. So rhinophyma, rhinoscleroma, rhinosporidiosis. I usually discuss them together. Uh, because similar sounding name in the choices they are often together. If they ask, want to ask question from one disease, they'll give you other names in the choices, so it becomes easier to pick up. And this will complete all the infection related disease of the nose that you have to know. Okay. Then uh, two fractures. Uh, one, what is leafoot fracture? Leafoot fracture is fracture of maxilla just the name and the leaf foot one leaf foot two and leaf foot three and they ask you the name sometimes so leaf foot one is called longitudinal fracture leaf foot two is called pyramidal fracture And leaf is called craniofacial disjunction. So the three names are important: leaf foot one, leaf foot two, leaf foot three. Not very popular. Once in a while they ask you this. Then septum fracture are two types. One is called severalate fracture. The other is George Abbey fracture. What is the difference between several fracture and George Abbey fracture of the nasal septum? Several fracture when the fracture line is vertical and George Abbey when it runs horizontal. So, fracture line which direction based on that it is either several or George Abbey. Now, these two fracture interesting. In leaf foot fracture, the treatment is open reduction. That means you have to cut open and then do the reason. In septum fracture, it is closed reduction. You don't give an incision, you don't cut anything, you just pull and push and align the bone. So, open reduction versus closed reduction. So, these are the only fractures of the ENT that are important. But there is one more fracture called blowout fracture, which is maybe ophthalmology, is a fracture of floor of orbit. And these are the scans. When the floor of the orbital fractures, the orbital tissue hangs in the maxilla. This is the tissue of the orbit hanging in the maxilla, and this is called teardrop sign. I am sure in ophthalmology they will discuss about this in more details. So, two points blowout fracture is the fracture of the floor of the orbit and the CT scan or extra findings described as tear drop sign. So, these are some of the fractures that you have to know in this ENT area and two tumors which are important uh, from the head and neck point of view. One is inverted papilloma. This is the most important tumor of head and neck and only four points about inverted papilloma, only four points. Number one, 
the other name. What is the other name? It is also called Ringer's tumor. That is the other name. Now, why is this tumor important? Because it is a benign tumor. with malignant potential. What is the meaning of this? That is by nature is benign, but it can convert into malignancy and that is why it is a dangerous tumor because it can convert into malignancy. Look at the CT scan and the picture and the last thing is the treatment. There are two answers to the same through this treatment. Both, are, both mean the same thing, different way of saying. Either you say excision with wide margin, we take a margin of 1 to 2 centimeters. The same is called medial maxillectomy. Excision with, wide, with the wide margin and medial maxillectomy, same thing. So, these are the three, four points about inverted papilloma, the most popular tumor of nose and sinus. And then two points about sinonasal carcinoma. I'll tell you three points about sinonasal carcinoma. Carcinoma of nose and sinus. Now, most common site is maxilla. Obviously, most of the disease in the sinuses are in the maxilla. And in the maxilla, it's usually the squamous cell carcinoma. Second most common site, ethmoid, but it is a different type. In the ethmoid, it is adenocarcinoma. Different types. Adenocarcinoma, there is a special feature, point you have to remember, it is seen in woodworkers. So, that is a very important point and very important MCQ also. They usually ask you in woodworkers, people are exposed to wood dust, which is a common tumor in these people. So, this one. And there is an uncommon tumor, but the name is important, called esthesia neuroblastoma. And they ask you, esthesia neuroblastoma arises from which of the following tissues? It arises from olfactory epithelium. We all know that in the nose, especially in the roof of nose, there is an olfactory epithelium. So, from there this tumor arises and that is why the name becomes important. Where does esthesia neuroblastoma arise from? It arises from the olfactory epithelium. Okay. So, only this much about carcinoma, but there was a name asked some time back called on grains line. Remember this name, on grains line is related to maxillary carcinoma. This is a line you have to draw this line. How do you draw this line? We draw this line from medial canthus of eye to angle of mandible. Now, if you draw a line that runs from medial canthus of the eye to the angle of the mandible, this line is called on grains line. And how it is used, how it looks. Let me show you the image of this line. Can you see this line? Yellow line is on grains line. In this person, this is going to the maxilla. See, this is the maxilla. And you realize now that on grains line, if you draw, it is going to divide the maxilla diagonally into two parts. The part of the maxilla, this one above the line, part of the maxilla, this one below the line. The part of the maxilla above the line is called suprastructure of the maxilla. Supra means upper suprastructure. And the one below the line is called infrastructure. Infra means below. So basically, on grains line divides the maxilla into suprastructure and infrastructure, two parts. But what is the benefit? How does it help us? Now, suprastructure carcinomas 
have poor prognosis. And infrastructure carcinoma has good prognosis. So, you can say that Ongen's lie helps us know the prognosis of maxillary carcinoma and that is why this name is important. They have asked few years back about this line. So, it tells us about the prognosis of maxillary carcinoma. You have to do CT scan, biopsy, histopathological examination, all that. But in most sinonasal carcinoma, we do surgery followed by radiotherapy is required for most of the sinonasal carcinoma surgery and radiotherapy. Okay. So, this will complete all the important nose disease also. So, guys and girls, in exactly 3 hours, we have completed ear, nose and throat. I am telling you, I have covered all the important topics, all the important points. This is the only thing you need to revise, but you have to revise multiple times. And also share this with your friends, your colleagues, so that everybody benefits from this. They can watch this. So, I, I will highly recommend that you watch it again, so that if you have missed some point, you can, if you are making notes, you can make the notes, add that or recollect if you have forgotten something. But this should be your like treasure for the last moment e intervention. Okay. So, that is all from my side. I hope this was useful, this session was useful. Thank you for joining me, staying with me and God bless you. Best of luck. I really hope we at DBMCI and Bhatia Institute, we really hope that everybody clears this exam, not only clears the exam, clears the exam with flying colors, good colors. Okay. So, good luck guys, good night and hope to see you again for PG exam, PG preparation next year. Hope we will do that mid day. Okay. Bye bye. Good night. Take care guys.